Well, welcome everyone to our Chatham House discussion today. Uh, we're just two days away now from the start of an event that China has been gearing up for for months, getting ready for it uh, and ensuring that this goes smoothly, uh, not just in Beijing, but everywhere around the country. Um, this has been a priority for millions of officials for months. Uh, that means if you're a local official, um, ensuring that there are no major workplace accidents in your area, no protests, and of course, no outbreaks of COVID-19. And in recent weeks, we've seen the extraordinary lengths that officials have been going to to keep this disease at bay in their areas. That's in part, of, of course, because of the long-standing zero COVID policy, uh, but also because of this Congress. There must be no blemishes. The event is about making the party and its leadership look good and woe betide any official whose locality becomes an embarrassment. The relentless emphasis on the need for stability at every level of government in China that we've seen in recent months is something, of course, that we see in the build up to every Congress. But this one is unusual, exceptional even. Uh, because this Congress is about the power of one man, Xi Jinping. Normally, we might be expecting him to, set, uh, to step down. He's served two five-year terms. Uh, many had once believed that was the norm for a general secretary. At this point, he should be handing over to a successor whose identity uh, we would have been pretty sure about for at least the past five years. But this is not going to happen. Xi Jinping is about to be anointed for a third term. So on top of all the usual anxiety that has gripped officialdom for months and months as preparations for this have picked up, there's been another layer of anxiety, a desire to prove loyalty to the man they're calling the helmsman, the people's leader. China is in a frenzy of adulation for Xi of a kind that we've not seen directed at a single leader in the build up to a Congress uh, any time before in the history of the reform era. Uh, I'm James Miles. I'm the um, China writer at large at The Economist. Um, and uh, this, uh, I'm somewhat embarrassed to say, will be the eighth Communist Party Congress that I've covered, either, uh, either close up or, or from afar uh, in my career as a journalist. Uh, they've all been pretty much the same the same choreography, the same control, no dissent, no meaningful debate, endless cheerleading for the party's achievements. One of them did stand out um, for having a different feel, and that was the first one that I covered in 1987, the 13th Party Congress. Uh, I was there when Zhao Ziyang, um, then the General Secretary, he'd just been confirmed in that position at the 13th Congress, met the press afterwards in a room in the Great Hall of the People. And what a moment that was. We could ask him anything. It was freewheeling. He cracked jokes. Uh, and, of, you know, of course, he gave little away. But he was making a statement that Chinese political culture could be a bit more normal. What we're about to witness will be far from normal by global standards. It will be tightly scripted, uh, a display of Communist Party power and Xi's power. Xi will not answer questions from journalists. Zhao's ideas back in the 1980s for what he called political reform will be far from Xi Jinping's mind. But it will be a feast for China watchers such as those we have with us today. Some of the finest in the business and let me introduce them. Uh, from uh, the University of Vienna is Ling Li, uh, who teaches Chinese politics and law and is an expert, among other things, on the institutions and processes of the party state in China. Uh, welcome, Dr. Li. Uh, in Beijing, we have Wang Xiangwei, a former editor-in-chief of the South China Morning Post and veteran China watcher whose columns for the newspaper are, are always full of insight. Uh, and here in London, we have Yu Jie, uh, who's a senior research fellow at Chatham House, specializing in Chinese foreign policy and 
economic diplomacy. So welcome all, and I really look forward to, to hearing your insights. Uh, first, what I'd like to do is, is ask each of you to summarize your views on various aspects of this event in just five minutes or so. And then I'll kick off a discussion uh, with some uh, follow-up uh, questions to each of you. Um, and then I'll invite members of the audience to, um, to raise your own questions, uh, which you can do in the chat box uh, of uh, Zoom. Um, so to begin with, um, I would like to ask um, uh, Ling, if I may, to uh, set out what, what a Communist Party Congress is all about. Uh, what does it do and why is it so important? Thank you, James. Um, the, the easiest way to summarize what the Party Congress uh, does is to read out the Party Constitution. Uh, according to the CCP Charter, uh, the Party Congress has six items of mandate, uh, which include to discuss and to listen to first, and then to pass uh, in terms of approval of the report delivered by the sitting Central Committee of this Party Congress, and then to pass the report of the Central Commission of Discipline and Inspection of the outgoing Party Congress. And the third one is to deliberate and decide on matters of great importance. What is great of great importance is not defined. The, the fourth one is to uh, uh, approve any amendment of the Party Charter. And the last two items is to elect the Central Committee and the Central Commission of Discipline and Inspection. Uh, regarding how the Party Congress is organized and how it operates, I only have time to address two things, which I think has uh, raised the most of the discussions on social media and the, the press media. The first thing is about uh, the the the, the choreography uh, you, you use the word choreograph choreographed the congress which means there's no ambush there we're not going to see what we see in the soviet union uh party congress events which is very ex exciting sometimes uh you you can topple mm -hmm. a, a very top leader without other people knowing who attended the the congress but that's not going to happen in the ccp congress that is because the entire institution is designed both before the Congress convenes and during the time where the Congress convenes that the planned outcome of the election will be delivered. The whole institution is designed to achieve that goal. However, this does not necessarily mean the Congress is not important because some people argue the whole thing uh, is just for a show. Uh, it carries no significance. My argument would be the opposite. It is because the party congress is so important because it carries the legitimacy of all these leadership changes so once the decision has been entered it will take at least five years to overturn it or reverse it so it's super important and it is because of that reason so much planning uh, rehearsing is put into it but then why the, 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 the event only takes uh, uh, less than a week uh, and we are, we are told that no surprise should be expected. So how to explain <clears throat> that? Uh, that's because something else, if we have time, I can address that later on. But the second issue I want to address is uh, the, the electoral outcome or selectoral outcome is staggered. And that means some people will stay, some people will go, uh, so as to ensure a measure of continuity of the leadership and the pace of the staggering. Uh, right now, the only observable consistent, consistent pattern for the staggering pace is the age through the age limit. That is, 
the most important factor that drives the turnout of the leadership. Uh, there's also argument because there seems to be inconsistency in this age limit, nor because Xi Jinping didn't uh, uh, allegedly didn't uh, comply with it. And there is certain inconsistency in the turnout of the Politburo member. But if we divide the entire central party leadership into three categories, you will see uh, very clear consistency. Uh, if you leave the, the head of the party, general party secretary or party chairman in the past time uh, out, of, out of the group, and then you divide Politburo standing committee member and Politburo member because they are two different groups. They share, they enjoy different level of privileges. So you will see the age is currently the only one that drives the access, that regulates the access of Politburo standing committee member other than the disciplinary uh, actions against them, which is rare uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, but for poll bureaus, uh, member, they don't enjoy the same level of privilege like the Power Bureau Standing Committee member is. Mm -hmm. So they, for them, age is a limit, it's a ceiling. If you're above it, you're out of the compensation. But if you're below it, it does not necessarily mean you will have a renewal of your membership. And that the, the inconsistency, the breaking of this norm, uh, so-called, did not happen at Xi Jinping's time. It happened during Hu Jintao's time. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the, the first time is 1997 regarding Li, Li Tieying, who was who retired before reaching the age 68. And that should be on the uh, Jiang Zemin's rule. OK, I will just stop there. Oh, well, thank you very much, uh, Ling, and, and just a quick observation from me on that, um, just how striking it's been, um, uh, how few, if any, leaks we've had of uh, the composition of the new uh, Politburo, um, which is perhaps a measure of how tightly controlled things are in the build-up to this Congress, but that's something we can get into a bit later. Uh, Xiang Wei, um, could you set out for us um, your expectations of this and, and particularly um, surrounding those questions of, of, uh, of uh, changes in the leadership. Thank you, James. And greetings from Beijing. I'm very pleased uh, to join this panel of influential speakers. Uh, you know, as you know, reading tea leaves of China's politics has always been a challenge because of its opacity and is even more difficult this time around until this Congress, uh, as Dr. Lee has mentioned, you know, there were some unofficial rules and norms, including the mm. representation of party factions and the retirement age that we could follow to make educated guesses about the new leadership lineup. But this time, that things are totally different. Uh, James, as you have mentioned, you know, uh, we are, a few days away from the Congress and, and, and there were a few leaks. Uh, but I mean, the, you know, the most important reason is that, you know, Xi Jinping uh, 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 is believed to have a, to have a dominant say in the leadership uh, composition. And what makes it even worse this time, even more difficult is that the speculation is mixed with strong feelings uh, towards uh, uh, Xi. So it's even so made, so it has made it harder to sift through the speculation and 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 try to uh, uh, get a, a some real sense of what is going on. You know, one obvious example is the. Uh, speculation of a coup late last month you know the fact that you know i find it i find this incredible you know the fact that such speculation could go viral says a lot about uh, some people's understanding of china's politics and also the current political climate in the country uh, having said that uh, based on my experiences of reading chinese politics uh, uh, over the past three decades and, and through speaking with friends and sources, 
I think I can share some broad and reasonable assumptions and predictions here. First of all, uh, in my mind, uh, uh, there is no doubt whatsoever uh, Xi Jinping is set to secure his non-busting third term, and most importantly, is set to remain as China's top leader in the next 10 years. So basically it means he will serve uh, his third term and, and very likely the fourth term until uh, uh, 2032. And I guess the wording and the tone of the speech she is to deliver at the beginning of the Congress, which opens on October the 16th. And later, uh, the composition of the new leadership will offer more confirmation uh, in this regard. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, she, she himself alone largely decides the new leadership lineup to be unveiled on 23rd or 24th uh, at the uh, first plenary session of the Central Committee of the 20th uh, Congress. I think uh, from what I gather, you know, this is the first time that she himself uh, decides the new leadership lineup. At the 19th Congress, uh, five years ago in 2017, which heralded his second term, I think the, the, uh, the belief uh, is that Xi Jinping himself had to defer to Jiang Zemin and the other party veterans over, the, over some of the candidates for the uh, top leadership. But I think this time, the influence of those party veterans definitely uh, uh, has waned. Uh, third point I, I want to uh, 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 offer is that China's leadership changes this time may be more dramatic than expected. I think right now there were two basic scenarios. Uh, there were basically two scenarios, I'm sorry. I mean, the first one is that uh, that she himself may have broken with tradition and made exception to himself, uh, but the, the norms and the unwritten rules would apply to the rest of the leaders. You know, the uh, unwritten rule, rule including the seven up and eight down, which means the leaders who have reached the age uh, uh, 67 could still serve another term. The leaders who have reach the age of 68 this year will step down. So in this scenario, that only two current uh, members uh, uh, of the Politburo Standing Committee uh, will retire, including Li Zhanshu, the chairman of National People's Congress, China's legislature, and Han Zheng, the executive vice premier, and Li Keqiang, currently China's number two, Premier Li Keqiang is uh, number two in terms of the uh, ranking in the Communist Party. He faces a two-term limit as Premier. And in this scenario, he will move on to become the new chairman of NPC. And Wang Yang uh, is currently ranked number four in, in the uh, hierarchy of the Communist Party, uh, will become uh, the Premier. And then, you know, this is the kind of, uh, you know, in a way, it's kind of a safe option that will be welcomed at home and abroad. The second option is that given Xi's rising power, you know, he wants to build a new team around him. Uh, in, in this scenario that at least four of the, the other six Politburo Standing Committee members are likely to retire, and 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 and, and including uh, uh, at least two people who have not reached the retirement age of 68. In this scenario, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Li Dan Shu and Han Zheng are looks at are set to go, and in this scenario, that uh, both Li Keqiang, the premier, and Zhao Leji, the head of anti-corruption agency are also most likely to retire. One mystery is whether Wang Huning, the ideology czar, 
will also retire. So that means the other than Xi, the, uh, the only person who most likely to stay will be Wang Yang. And now as things go, I think the, the latter scenario, this scenario now seems more likely. And Ding Xuexiang, uh, Xi Jinping's trusted political aide, his chief of staff, is a leading candidate to get a seat on the new Politburo Standing Committee. And Chongqing Party Secretary uh, uh, Chen Ming'er, uh, you know, he is another uh, 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 Xi Jinping's favorite. He is also <coughs> for elevation. And then the Shanghai Party Secretary Li Qiang, um, uh, uh, as I understand it, he is still in the race, despite the earlier debacle in handling a major corona outbreak in Shanghai, where you know, you know, the people in Shanghai uh, endured at least two months of lockdown. And the Guangdong Party Secretary Li Xi, I think, is also another strong contender to make it to the top seven. Uh, Vice Premier uh, uh, Hu Chunhua. Uh, he also has a chance, and the you know the fate of who whether who will uh, receive the elevation is very interesting. Is because right now he's uh, uh, other than Li Keqiang, he's the uh, another candidate with the sort of a uh, a strong affiliation with the uh, Communist Youth League, uh, the power base of former President Hu Jintao. Uh, Wang Yang uh, uh, may have come from the Communist Youth League background, but he is known as the man for all seasons. So he he should not be seen as as uh, as uh, as a representative from the uh, Communist uh, Youth League. So in this scenario, you know, Wang Yang could just be one of the candidates to become premier. I mean, there. Are, if, if the second, if this scenario I'm talking about it happens, and then, you know, there could be some other uh, stronger candidates to, to, uh, to assume the premiership. And now, uh, now we also come to another interesting question. If the scenario I have just described occurs, and then another interesting question is whether the heirs apparent will emerge. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, she is set to stay in power for at least another 10 years. I don't think he has any need, nor he's in a hurry to point a successor. Uh, doing this early could create uh, policy uncertainty. So, you know, in my mind, you know, you know, I would guess that the question of heir parent may be addressed at the uh, uh, 21st Congress five years later, the earliest. So, uh, at, so at this Congress, uh, the promotion of younger officials to the Politburo Standing Committee does not really necessary to give any hints at the uh, succession. Uh, that's just my two, two, two cents worth, James. Thank you very much, Xiangwei. So a lot of very important uh, detail there. Uh, and of course, worth um, uh, repeating what, what you've already said, that this will come out after the Congress, in fact, at the first plenum of the new Central Committee. So it's really two extremely important meetings we're looking forward to, what, the first one lasting about a week, and then uh, the next one half a day. Um, uh, on the day after the Congress, and, and that's when we'll get the big announcements of the uh, the new Politburo lineup. Uh, Yujia, can we turn to you now? Um, and would you like to um, point out some of the uh, the policy issues that might arise from uh, Xi Jinping's report to the Congress, um, which is expected to be a, a three hour speech uh, if, if uh, uh, the record of the uh, 19th Congress is repeated? Um, particularly in the area of uh, 
uh, foreign policy. And, and of course, so much of the speculation surrounding the leadership does relate to who will be the next foreign policy chief after Yang Jiechi steps down uh, from the Politburo, if he does. Um, uh, but uh, in that domain um, and economic uh, foreign policy, what can we expect? Well, thank you so much, James, for this. Uh, first of all, welcome everyone to Chatham House. Delighted to see so many faces here. Um, secondly, what I, according to what I've heard from Jiang Wei, it seems to be that the party congresses, which I have covered and will continue to cover, and that seems to be under presidency, so in the next 10 and 20 years or so. So the, this is my second Congress being covered. Previously, I covered this at LSE. Now, um, let's look into some big policy directions in here. And surely, as we said, there will be a political report um, published on Sunday, which is firstly to review what the party has done in the last five years and forecast what party will do in the next five years and to 10 years and so on and so forth. It is not a standard speech that really attracts attention and public perception, to be honest. I mean, it'll be quite a dry public account that essentially is Xi Jinping tell the rest of the colleagues of the, the world largest communist party, the world largest political party, what are we expecting to do? Now, the three things come to my mind. And firstly, um, it is on this very strong notion of self-reliance of China. So that is according to what has been published last week, you know, the seventh plenum of the 19th Party Congress, the readout. I mean, much has been pointed towards that China has now entering a period of extremely choppy water in terms of economy and also a very precarious international situation for China. So obviously that would require some sense of assessment and some of direction turning that Chinese economy will have to rely on by itself. It can no longer just rely on export growth led economic model like in the past, for example. Firstly, for the weak demand from the global market, but secondly, it is also for China's much fraught international relations, which is major trading partner such as United States and European Union. So we're going to hear so much sense of self-reliance, um, not just in terms of technology sector. I mean, technology sector is one thing, but I think we will hear far more on how China is going to engineering the economy for itself. So for me, the big headline would be the economic self-reliance. That's one thing. Now, secondly, come back to the question on security. Obviously, Xi Jinping introduced this holistic approach of national security back to two years ago and so on and so forth. So what we expect to see is that expect Xi Jinping to tie up that sense of national security together with economic growth. So it is no longer just about China will be able to producing this amazing staggering economic growth data. So GDP growth, I mean, so on and so forth, double GDP digit is no longer really matters anymore. But instead, Xi Jinping is generally seeking, firstly, whether China will be able to uh, secure the food security, and secondly, China is able to secure its energy security. So I think these are the naturally, the, um, the party thinking of its own survival and also the survival of the state, precisely because China is now having an extreme difficult relationship with the West, um, uh, US-led West and so on and so forth. Um, what would be the way to save itself? So that, that sense of caution and soberness, um, which is rather unprecedented compared with in the 19th Party Congress, the time when the economy was doing okay and China's relations with the rest of the world is relatively stable. So then that brings ultimately the question on foreign affairs. You know, what kind of relationship that China is very keen to set up? I mean, I'm more an optimistic person that hoping there would be a positive course correction um, regarding on China's relationship with the West, especially given China's very interesting choice on Russia's invasion towards Ukraine, because what China has done is China has underestimated the unity of the West, but overestimate the disunity, the division between EU and United States. So I think um, if Beijing wants to save its own economy, really out of economic necessity, and perhaps we should have a positive course correction on so foreign affairs and improving its relationship um, with the um, G7s and others. 
But this doesn't mean that China only focuses on G7s and the relationship with the West. I think what we're going to hear is we're going to hear much far more emphasis on China's relationship with the many of the developing countries. Um, so, for example, Xi Jinping introduced his ideas on global development initiative and so on and so forth. That is precisely tailored for from now on what kind of development relationship that China is very keen to establish with the so-called global south. And China also realized that it will have to count on the global south to help China internationally, irrespective of some votes with the United Nations or on something else, on China's own neighborhood, for example. I mean, this is the country shared a border with 14 different countries, and then predominantly the other developing countries. And I would say predominantly, even if the Chinese economy is turning inward, I think much of the foreign economic policy will be pointed towards South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Central Asia, really to guarantee a safe neighborhood for China's own economic development. So I think these are the things. Now, obviously, this leaves the very odd of the Taiwan question, um, so-called Taiwan question referred by the party. What are they going to do? Um, I think the key thing in here, it is to carefully observe the language on the paragraph that is sold together with Hong Kong and Macau and Taiwan to see whether Xi Jinping would like to keep the term so-called peaceful re reunification in there. And if we still have that term, and that means that we do not really have a dramatic shift on the policies towards Taiwan. But if we do not see that term, and then that really signify a significant shift in terms of on China's Taiwan policy. So I think these are the big foreign affairs issues. Now, when you ask me for the prediction of who will be the next foreign minister, mm, it's a very hard one to choose. Obviously, Yang Jiechi, my alumni from LSE, will step down. Um, whether Wang Yi will be able to fill that shoes, um, we don't know. And also, I think the backdrop for this is that Wang Yi is someone who has not really served as an ambassador to the United States, um, has a sufficient experience in dealing with Asian affairs, but not necessarily sufficient experience in terms of dealing European affairs and American affairs, which seems to be always the first choice when it comes to the foreign, minister, um, the foreign ministers or the most senior foreign officials. So um, there has been quite a discussion that we might likely to see a foreign minister that is not come from the foreign ministry, but from somewhere else. So who knows? I think we're going to have a firm name by March next year in the time of the National People's Congress, which is essentially about the cabinet shuffle for the uh, state council. So I think by then we should know who the foreign minister will be. But I think so far, what we, we can say is that we will have one spot to be kept on the foreign affairs issue at the Politburo. So you're going to remember that when it comes to China, it is always the domestic politics given the priority over foreign affairs. So therefore, you only have one spot on Politburo to dealing with foreign policy issues. Back to you, James. Well, thanks very much indeed, yeah, um, fascinating. Um, I suppose one one um, term, just to follow up on that, 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 that has come up at previous Congresses is the idea of strategic opportunity for China. Um, that yes, there are um, challenges in the global environment, uh, but overall, uh, the period China faces is, is that of opportunity uh, in terms of uh, its global rise. Would you expect, given uh, you know just how those challenges have evolved over the past five years since the last Congress, um, not least uh, the war in Ukraine, um, COVID, the growing tensions with America um, uh, over Taiwan, uh, would would the language surrounding um, that? be changed? Would we expect China to portray the world as, as a more threatening place, I suppose, um, to, to China's rise? Well, I think it's already indicated, again, from the readout of the, the seventh plenum of 19th Party Congress last week. I mean, I went through the line, I'm sorry, this week. Um, now, what we have in here is the job, the world of the strategic opportunity, which is, has been referred from Jiang Zemin ever since. So what Beijing really sees the international situation is almost like it is too threatening for China 
And what can China do to protect itself? I mean, that's how I read things. And especially when they're referring to the war in Ukraine, it's not a war in Ukraine, it's the so-called Ukraine crisis. So how Beijing could rise to the challenge of this particular crisis and hence what would change in terms of geopolitical standing um, beside China? Because what China felt so far, it seems to be that sense of loneliness, almost the sense of loneliness at the international stage, um, that thing by being a great, by being a big country, but very few followers. So I think it's no longer about the talk of strategic opportunity, but the talk of strategic survival. That seems to be more in, in tune with the mood in Beijing these days. Uh, Ling, I, I'd like to um, turn to you um, on the mechanics of uh, this Congress, and, and you know we've all kind of characterized this as something that is um, tightly choreographed, scripted. Um, and yet, of course, we should bear in mind that there will be more candidates than the number of seats to be filled uh, in the Central Committee. Um, in the past, uh, the difference has been more than 8%, I believe. Uh, and perhaps, again, worth recalling that 13th Communist Party Congress back in 1987, uh, when there was a, a startling development um, surrounding the voting procedure for the Central Committee. Deng Li Chun, who was then uh, the propaganda chief, uh, failed to make it onto the Central Committee and therefore failed to make it into the Politburo. Uh, could we see surprises like that again? How important is that particular part of the process? Um, let me address the question uh, about the, in, the, the, the weird paradox between the tightly script and choreographed process of the party Congress. And at the same time, the Congress is supposed to be uh, a, a, a forum to legitimize very important party decisions. How, how come, so there's a, a, a professor Wu Guang who I respect a lot, who has done a brilliant research about all the past party congresses. And he has developed one concept, which was <clears throat> the party congress was hollowed out because it was so scripted and choreographed. But my argument would be, uh, it is because the party congress is so important and the current party leaders doesn't want any surprise to happen during that process, because once it's done, it, the, the damage will be deep. It's very difficult to reverse. Uh, and they don't want similar situation as happened in the Soviet party congresses. So what has happened in the last about 40 to 30 years is the party has changed how the party congress was uh, conducted. In the Maoist era, the party congress could take two months. So there would be a lot of deliberations back and forth, uh, changing the candidates, uh, suggested candidate, candidates list and send it back for a revote. It can go on several rounds. And that's why the, the, the Congress uh, took so, such a long time. But it is from the, 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 the first party Congress that you attended in 1987, it started to standardize the time and shorten it. And for the last since then, every party Congress ended on the seventh day, very sharp and punctuate. So within a very limited time period, you have to achieve this result, which is have all the uh, delegates to pass the suggested list of candidates to these positions. So they have advanced all the deliberation process way ahead of the Congress. And we have learned the party started to prepare for the list and deliberate on the list, inviting opinions, suggestions, consultations, at least six months ahead of the Congress. So they have uh, kind of uh, segregated the deliberation phase and the final voting phase so that to ensure the voting can be done in a very short span of time with great certainty and predictability. Uh, so that should explain why it's all on the one hand important, but on the second hand, on the other hand, it uh, seems 
all symbolic, which it is not. Um, the second question is about the, sorry, <laughs> I, I put so much focus on the, <laughs> on the choreography, uh, but I uh, the, 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 the differential in the number of um, oh, yes, central the committee surprise. seats and, and the number of candidates. Yes, because the, the, there's a charge, right? For central committee members, the, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's competitive at the minimal level, right? For the Paul Bureau, Paul Bureau Standing Committee and General Party Secretary, it's non-competitive, which means only one candidate will be proposed for one seat. But for central committee members, you will have more people, uh, more candidates than the seats, although it's still very low. It's like for every 100 seats, you will have 110 or 109 candidates proposed to fill those seats. So there will be people, candidates, who are going to be voted out and that's tolerated in the process and that's what it's supposed to be. And to control the process, uh, as I argued, there's this uh, presidium standing committee, which is comprised all the sitting members of the Paul Bureau and all the retired uh, um, former members of the Paul Bureau standing committee. And sometimes uh, at critical times, you will see more members from the military because they have some contingency seat for that body as well. So they're going to deal with any surprises, any unexpected events, like uh, if uh, a highly uh, uh, wanted candidate didn't get the sufficient vote, and then they can start the political persuasion of the delegates and put them to the right direction. Uh, so it's still very much controlled competition to ensure that the, the final outcome is expected and acceptable. Thanks. Uh, and a, um, a follow-up to you, um, Xiang Wei, and, and, and that is, um, I suppose, why does all this matter? I mean, we've been saying for quite a long time now that Xi Jinping is incredibly powerful, uh, that he has no real challengers. Um, that he has or will have more protégés in the Politburo, um, does that really make a difference? Um, you know, a striking thing uh, in parallel to our assessment that um, Xi Jinping is as powerful as Deng or Mao is that, in fact, all along he's been surrounded by people who are legacies of the previous system, including the Prime Minister, uh, Li Keqiang, including his uh, hatchet man in the, in the anti-corruption campaign, uh, Wang Qishan, including his propaganda chief, uh, Wang Huning, including his foreign policy chief, Yang Jiechi. Uh, they're all people who rose to uh, extremely prominent positions before Xi Jinping took over. Um, so clearly it has not prevented him from establishing his authority already. Um, why should having more people close to him actually make a difference? James, I, I think that's a fascinating question. I, you know, I think, you know, right now that the, uh, the message is that, you know, as a, 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 a henchman, as the great leader, you know, he has set very uh, a grand direction for the country. I think the sort of economic problems, the financial difficulties, uh, the uh, social problems that China is facing. I think his, his supporter is pushing the message that is, is, he has set a wise direction. You know, he is the wise man. It's the people who work under him have not really fulfilled uh, their tasks. They have, they have done a terrible job. I mean, you know, as you have mentioned that until uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, 18th Party Congress uh, uh, at 2012, when he was made the party chief, that he, he barely had any say in how the leadership uh, uh, team was formed. I mean, it's mainly, you know, Jiang Zemin uh, 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 made the final decisions. I mean, even at the, as I mentioned earlier, even at the 19th Party Congress in 2017, he will have to defer to Jiang to, to uh, 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 you know, on, 
on some of the choices on the polar sort of polar bureau standing committee. So now, you know, after the five years that now he has become the chairman of everything. Now he wants, I think uh, that he wants to, he believes that, <clears throat> as I said earlier, the problems that China is facing, the economic headwinds China is facing is because the, it's not he has set a wrong direction is because the people who work for him have not really done their jobs well. So I think the message is that if he, if he promotes uh, the people he believe are, uh, are more capable and things will change. I think that's one thing. The second thing I want to say is, is that, I, you know, I want to touch on the issue that uh, Dr. Lee has, uh, has mentioned about, you know, how China's leadership selection process uh, has evolved. And I, and I would let uh, add some thoughts on that, uh, you know, to show that you know the uh, sort of sort of previously uh, at the party congresses under Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, and Hu Jintao, that there was room for for debates, for 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 political uh, uh, maneuvering, as you mentioned that. Uh, Deng Liqin was maneuvered out of the Central Committee. I don't think that's that's the case now. Even with the competitive Central Committee elections, I think the things are basically have already decided. Has uh, you know things have already been decided. Uh, I you know you know let me just sort of give you an example. I mean I mean because under under President Xi, I think the uh, so-called uh, 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 intra-party democracy has died. You know, I think Xi's predecessors, Jiang Zemin and particularly Hu Jintao, had uh, actively promoted the standardization and institutionalization of leadership process through uh, internal polls and competitive election of the party uh, central committee members, uh, you know, known as the intra-party democracy. I mean, you know, the results, uh, the results were that a series of norms were established, including the norm that requires leaders to remain at the age of 67, but will have to retire at the age of 68. Uh, and, you know, let me give you an example that uh, for instance, in June 2007, uh, uh, four months before the 17th uh, Congress, uh, when she is promoted to the uh, Politburo Standing Committee, who, uh, at that time, President Hu Jintao and his, his supporters organized a straw poll to recommend candidates for the 25-member Politburo. And five years later, in May 2012, five months before the 18th Congress, the internal poll was extended to create a short list of candidates for the Politburo Standing Committee. And in both cases, the internal polls were used as a major benchmark to shape up the new leadership lineup. And, and, and as you can see, that she has benefited immensely. But after the 19th Party Congress uh, that she believed after the 18th Party Congress, I'm sorry, that she believed that the, uh, you know, those internal polling methods and also the so other practices of the inter-party democracy uh, were, could uh, elect the wrong people. So I think uh, uh, in the run up to the 19th Congress in 2017, she has completely transformed the leadership selection process and concentrate the power in his own hands. That, you know, back, you know, five years ago, he has completely abandoned all the intra-party democracy practices and, and, and he has chosen face-to-face -face interviews to create a short list of candidates. Uh, and, and, and then the, the mo you know, the rest of the people are, are were were kept in dark, 
until uh, the very last minutes. And then, and I'm sure he will he will follow up this practice uh, for the upcoming uh, uh, leadership changes. James, thank you, Shang Wei. Um, uh, I'd like to um, uh, to put some questions that have been raised by uh, members of our audience, um, and um, one has come in from Dina Mufti, um, who asks what the circumstances were um, in which. Xi Jinping announced that he was staying on for a third term. Was there a, a moment in the party at a central committee meeting or, or some other forum at which he actually uh, declared this? I mean, of course, we all uh, suppose that this was the case uh, when the presidential term limit was ended in, in 2018, yeah. uh, but, but how did it actually work inside the party? Uh, me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if, I, well, I, uh, know, anyone else? Yeah, but, yeah I mean, uh, you know, yeah. I'm sure uh, Dr. Yu and <laughs> Dr. Lee can add. I mean, from my understanding, that you don't really need occasion. I mean, because over the past five years, particularly this year, I mean, the the propaganda is out every day to say that you know she is the man to lead China. So I don't think, I think, you know, as I said earlier, that. The the rest, uh, you know, the uh, all the you know, ma the majority of the party delegates attending the uh, uh, party congress, which starts in a few days, they have no idea uh, what are the you know what are the candidates being promoted uh, proposed to the leadership uh, for the for the uh, top leadership. Is that the, the, the party delegates at the 20th Congress, they are, you know, you know, their mandate is to elect the new central committee members. And the, the new central committee members are only to be given the list of candidates for the Politburo and Politburo Standing Committee on the day, uh, as you mentioned, the day after the uh, the congress the congress ends and the uh, at the meeting at the first plenary session of the central committee the new central committee of the 20th congress where the new central committee members uh, are given the list you know for that half day meeting and then I'm, I'm i'm i mean because for the politburo and the politburo standing committee it's not a competitive election they are basically give a list of people to vote and then Probably, you know, I've I've never been into this meeting, and there have been never there has uh, no reports about how how this meeting is conducted. But I'll I'll presumably that the central committee members will will be given a list and shows that Xi Jinping as the party secretary, uh, as the party general secretary, and then his name will probably at the very top. So the new, all the new central committee members will know that he is the man, and then uh, uh, that the, the uh, you know the the uh, the list of candidates will probably rank uh, uh, according to the ranking in the party. So probably Xi's name at the very top of the shortlist, and then whoever is going to become the premier will his name will be second, and then third, fourth. And then in that case, the new central committee members will know who will be the party chief and who will be the premier and who will be the uh, MPC chairman and CPPCC chairman, the anti-corruption agency chief and executive vice premier. I'm sure the list of, of candidates, the new central uh, committee members are given are probably ranked in that way, so they will know. Uh, well, ask your uh, question. It does. Thank uh, you. Uh, uh, and I, I just I, add I, some ahead, more, more speculation, uh, adding to uh, Xiang Wei's um, uh, picturing of the the ballot. Uh, it's yes, it's, it's so many things are still not known to us, including the the actual the practical voting procedure. Uh, so uh, to to go further, 
uh, on this question about the ballots. Uh, we don't know whether there will be one single ballot where all these three uh, offices or decision-making bodies will be listed separately or you vote. So uh, in theory, you should vote the Politburo first and then among the Politburo members, then they will, certain people will be selected for the Politburo standing committee. And then from that body, there will be one person heading the party. So we don't know whether that takes three steps to achieve to the end, the head of the party, or it's voted in one go, everything is written in one ballot. It's something we still don't know uh, yeah. and probably will never know. That's true. But I can tell you that, you know, for CCDI, the anti-corruption agency, I think that's easy. Probably just one ballot, one name. So, so people will know that person will be the new, new chairman of, 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 of uh, the, cent uh, the Central Commission for, for Discipline Inspection. But for CCDI, I uh, there's still a standing committee. And usually there will be like a dozen or a little bit more uh, standing committee members. And among the standing committee members, there will be uh, one, yes, one uh, secretary, but several vice secretaries. So they have to be able to figure out. But the, the sequence of the name, obviously, is a very strong indication, usually according yeah. to party practices. If they don't list them separately, then it must be according to the sequence of the position on the list. So there will be a way to signal that. And remember, all the voting is going to take place after this political persuasion, yunyang chengxu. And during that procedure, uh, the information will be hinted to the, to the voters, for sure. I mean, obviously, it's not a party that you run through a campaign, like what you have seen the British Tory party campaign as such at all. I mean, there are certain unspoken rules there that you just don't expect the senior party leaders were spelled out very clearly because everyone certainly have a stake with this. And if anyone who will be able to leak the information, and I think that person will be accused at the end. Now, not just the Politburo and Politburo Standing Committee. I think what will be also interesting to look into is who will be the new Central Committee members. And many of them actually, interestingly, have a very strong background on industries and innovation and technology. So that is clearly indicated uh, the policy direction this country is going to go and also what how influential they are and lately going to be calculated and how likely that China is going to pursue that path of self-reliance. So I think it's not just a 25 and a 7, or we might get 7, we might get 9, or we got 5, but it's also that 203 number of people we should be also be watch out as well. Um, we're running out of time, sadly, um, yeah. but I would like to put a final question to all of you and I think it's um, for many people a burning question. Um, it is a question that relates to uh, the future of China's economy and therefore of um, uh, global prosperity. Um, what's going to happen to zero COVID? Um, we can certainly expect that um, what has been achieved so far will be declared a great victory um, but will we get a signal that this is going to be wound down. Um, what about soon after the Congress? Will a timetable soon emerge for getting us out of zero COVID and, and back to normal? Um, um, I can start. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, China's uh, is going to send a message that uh, soon after the Congress ends, probably in November, that China is going to uh, uh, further reduce the uh, the number of quarantine days for overseas rivals uh, from currently from from the current regimen of seven plus three to uh, four four plus three. Uh, uh, however, on the at home, I think the uh, tight restrictions uh, will remain in place until China's this political cycle is. Uh, has come to a full stop, which is in March, uh, when the uh, uh, NPC, the National People's Congress annual sessions uh, will be held to uh, elect, uh, uh, to confirm, I should say, to confirm Xi Jinping as the president for another uh, term, 
and also to elect a new cabinet. Uh, I don't think China will relax the COVID restrictions at home uh, uh, until March. However, because the, the Chinese leadership is under huge pressure from businesses and from foreign investors about keeping out the, the, the visitors, overseas visitors. So that's why I believe that they're going to relax the, the, uh, uh, the reduce the number of quarantine days for overseas rivals. And also China has also started to issue uh, uh, visas to foreign students uh, who over the past uh, three years been sort of uh, do remote learning uh, uh, in their own countries. Uh, I think uh, they, but the rest, but at home, the re restrictions definitely will remain in place. Thank you. Uh, Ling, do you agree? Um, I, I would also make some comments on the COVID policy because it's uh, in everyone's mind, including my own mind. Um, I can think of uh, three practical functions of keeping the zero po uh, COVID policy right now. One for disease control, which is an arguable case scientifically, medically. Uh, I wouldn't go into that, but the, the persuasive value uh, of continuing to use zero COVID policy as a method of disease control will decline um, if COVID uh, continues to develop the way it develops. And the second uh, reason or function is for uh, restriction of mobility. Um, it's very important. It has high imminent value for the party ahead of the party Congress, which can probably be extended to the, to the uh, National People's Congress next year in March as well. But once all this political cycle, as uh, uh, Xiang Wei mentioned, has ended, then that function will uh, start to decline in its value as well. And the third function is for political legitimacy because uh, the COVID control had worked at the beginning in the early stages of the pandemic. And it was at that time, it was uh, promoted. Uh, it was written in this discourse uh, with, where the policy was a living proof of the superiority of the Chinese, uh, of the, the political system of China with Chinese characteristics, which was associated with the emergence of the Xi Jinping thought, his personal ideology. So so once this ideology uh, is confirmed and written into the party charter uh, at an elevated, uh, even more elevated level at this Congress, then its value will decrease as well. So once all that had happened, I don't see any rational reason to keep it uh, as it is now. And remember, even for the Great Leap Forward, it ended within three years for the Cultural Revolution, the most core part of it, which is to seize power, also ended within three years. So there's no reason for all this policy to continue, especially under so much pressure from uh, home and abroad that the government is facing. Thank you. Uh, Uge, I suppose your, your um, <clears throat> uh, thoughts about self-reliance and so on in, in the report um, suggest that they're not going to be in a hurry to import um, foreign mRNA vaccines, so it could be quite a long wait before they're confident enough in, in, in their own ability with vaccines. Well, mRNA is one issue. I think another issue in here is that um, the ICU bed coverage in China. I think that's perhaps really a leadership's back mind is that, well, we have around 30,000 public hospitals, mm -hmm. but the ICU bed coverage um, for the elderly population like in China will be insufficient. So I think that's a, perhaps one reason to keep the zero COVID policy over here. But then the misfortune in here is that zero COVID policy has really led a very high level youth unemployment. The number of young people that generally the party looking to attract towards to, and they would really lost the face towards the party. So I think ultimately for the legitimacy question, the party will have to think somehow try to mending this relationship with the younger population and open up the society firstly. And secondly, even though, as I said, the, the pen threshold of having a lower GDP growth has been adjusted, 
But that means that China cannot really slide into sluggish economic growth. That won't just won't help the CCP performance at all. So I think for all that various reason, zero COVID will be lifted very soon. Not as soon as we're going to have a precise timeline, but surely this is not doing party any good. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, apologies for running over time. Uh, lots more to discuss, uh, but I hope you've all um, uh, learned from our uh, panel of uh, wonderful experts uh, today. Um, I certainly have. Uh, thank you, Wang Xiangwei, um, Ling Li, Yu Jie. Uh, it's been a fascinating hour of discussion. Um, uh, thank you all very much. <laughs>